It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Mike Cosper. I'm joined by Nicole Martin and Russell Moore. Today on the show, what's going on in Congress? Then Thomas Kidd is going to join us to talk about how we talk about people after they pass away. And then we're going to wrap up our show by talking about what's happening now at McLean Bible Church. Stay with us. All right, the gang's all here. We're all back. Russell and Nicole, I think it's been a few weeks since we've all been able to be on here together, so it's good to see everybody. This week, Congress held hearings about anti-Semitism on campus. They called in the presidents of several universities to testify, including Claudine Gay from Harvard, Sally Kornbluth from MIT, and Elizabeth McGill of the University of of Pennsylvania. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? Most people probably have seen footage of some of the protests that have taken place on campus with students marching and shouting from the river to the sea or hosting die-ins, protesting for the Palestinian people, or protesting. You've seen a number of these protests that are frankly celebrations of the massacre of October the 7th, celebrating it as an act of revolution against colonizers. Russell, maybe let me start with you. What did you see in those hearings yesterday? What did you make of them? This was a really clarifying moment because there couldn't be an answer yes or no to, as Elise Stefanik, I'm no Elise Stefanik, fan, but she was right to say this is the easiest question that could be asked and answered. And that's also true because if you look at much of what we have seen, there's an excellent David Frum piece in The Atlantic talking about the ways that these universities have treated speech itself as violence over the past several years and in ways that have been often completely ridiculous when it comes to free speech. And yet, when it comes to calling for genocide to Jewish students on campuses, we can't say anything about that. When the president of Penn says, if it becomes action, the action here is genocide, this is beyond comprehension. And there are several people who have pointed out, too, that a lot of this, if you notice the sort of, I used to be part of and to supervise a faculty, so I recognize this sort of faculty speak that happens here. And a lot of that is coming from a sense of fear of the students themselves. I don't know if you all saw the Biden White House interns put out a statement. I've been an intern at Washington. Interns usually don't put out statements about anything. And they put out a statement castigating President Biden for his foreign policy and saying, essentially, we're really disappointed because these weren't the reasons that we chose to intern at the White House, which is just such an upside down world where you have people fearful of constituencies that are some place to learn. There have been surveys that have been done in recent days on college campuses among activists who are chanting from the river to the sea. Wall Street Journal has a piece about this saying, okay, what river and what sea? And they don't know. And then when you show them it's the Jordan River to all the way over, what this means is that Israel doesn't exist. Huh, I didn't know that. You have everything right now is really upside down. And I think this series of comments just shows that. I've been really wrestling with this because I think when we had conversations about protests on campus, there is a part of that narrative that says, these are kids. They have no idea. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the full story. And it's a matter of educating them. But when you have university presidents refusing to deny 
and annihilation of a people group. The same university presidents that have been on record in previous times with umbrella issues of civil rights. And I must say, I am opposed to making the issue of civil rights an umbrella issue for all issue of rights. We do this all the time. We say we have civil rights for the 60s for African Americans, so therefore we need to have civil rights for LGBTQ communities. I think there has to be distinction between certain categories. But these presidents have created no distinction between categories of race, of sexual identity, of all other areas of diversity and inclusion, except for Jews. I'm a product of a mix of the liberal education and the more conservative Christian education, and I was disappointed because I felt like I've been in situations where presidents and faculty members stood up for me, and I can't imagine what it would feel like to know that your university president doesn't stand up for you. I don't know what that feels like. It, well, especially when you add to it, look at what we saw this week with a Jewish-owned restaurant in Philadelphia with a mob of people chanting, Goldie, you can't hide uh, about the owner of the restaurant because he's Jewish. David French and I, about once every two days, one of us will reference that old Monty Python skit that talks about the skulls on the helmets of Nazi soldiers and saying, are we the baddies? If you hear yourself chanting something like that, it doesn't take a comprehensive view of history to be able to say, wait a minute, maybe I've made some bad choices that have led me to this point. And then when you add to that, the grown-ups, supposed grown-ups in the room who, when asked, get all scared and speaking gobbledygook, that's wild. Mm -hmm. My friend Roger Berkowitz wrote what I think is a really remarkable article about all of this. He wrote it just a few weeks after the war broke out. Roger runs the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College and is on the faculty there. But he wrote the letter because some of these similar kinds of protests were breaking out on the Bard campus. And the faculty was coming out and saying, literally passing around a letter, including asking Roger to sign this letter, essentially saying, our sympathies are with the students. We support the students in this. One of the things he talks about in it is he says, I get that these are students. In fact, it's really important that we understand that these are students and that they're in an environment where they're here to learn, and most of them have no clue what they're talking about, right? Most of them are reacting to things that are very human and that we can all understand in terms of like when you see the suffering of children, people who are bombed and that sort of thing, your sympathies are there. But then he says this. He says, my colleagues who signed this letter are not students. They're adults, people I work with. Some of them are brilliant. Many I respect. A few are people who've sat at my dinner table, reading the names of people I call friends on this letters was one of the most difficult experiences of my life. In that moment, it felt like a punch to the gut. Beyond the personal, for faculty to sign such a letter also denies their professional responsibilities. Our job as teachers is not to support our students in their tribal sensibilities and their reductionistic moral righteousness. It's to make them understand the complexities and challenges of the real world. Standing with our students in their one-sided moralism is not an act of friendship that ennobles their humanity. It's to join them in their self-satisfied orgy of truth-telling. It is precisely not what we should be doing. I think that's one of the things that's so remarkable about this, is that you have a dereliction of duty, right? Like that's you're right. there to educate, to form minds, to form moral opinions and all of this. And so each one of these presidents actually says, I find the language morally abhorrent, then you have a responsibility to educate. And it reminds me, here we go with bulletin bingo, here comes a Dallas Willard mention. But it's one of the things Willard lamented was that the academy had lost any sense of responsibility for moral formation of people, of being able to inform them about making judgments of good and evil. And what's interesting is it's like the university is happy to morally form them in terms of a specific ideological frame. But when it comes to morals that would cut through that ideological frame or any ideological frame, they're suddenly silent. This goes back to this larger problem of a reaction to any sort of authority, which the entire process of teaching is based upon that. There's a transferring of knowledge from one person or one uh, community to another community. And when that is all replaced, and this can happen easily in a discipleship context and a church context, where what we do is just to say, okay, what do the people I'm charged with 
forming already think and let me say that back to them. And that just completely makes nonsense of not just what the Bible has given us to do internally within the church, it makes nonsense of any organization, which is why you have not just the academy that's in crisis, you have institution after institution for this very reason. And what has to happen is there have to be leaders who aren't afraid. And those are going to be the ones who actually are going to be able to lead forward because they're not afraid of mobs, whatever those mobs are. That's what we need. And there has to be a willingness to hold what must be held in tension while also taking a stand for courage. So one thing that kind of triggers me about this whole issue is you have a lot of people say, I can't stand with Israel because then that would mean standing against the oppression in Palestine, which is akin to standing with slave owners and standing against the slave. Again, I think I have a tiny bit of an allergic reaction to trying to simplify points of history and making them all the same. And that again, that's the ideology that's at the root here, is this ideology of, call it a victim culture, or call it a certain kind of intersectionality or whatever, that says all suffering, all oppression, it's all equal, and all resistance is righteous in all forms. And part of what's remarkable about that kind of flattening of this conflict is that it suddenly puts these billionaire death cult leaders who live in Qatar and lead Hamas in the same category as a Palestinian child. Yeah. As though they were the same. Now, does that mean – I'm not saying there's not room to to raise concerns about how Israel carries out the war. I think there's – free speech arguments on all fronts about how all of that goes. There's freedom of thinking. We should talk about that. We should argue about that. But if you want to talk about the notion of justice means that evildoers are brought to justice and these terrorists are evil. Terrorism is an evil act of hurting the most vulnerable, most innocent of a society to terrify everyone else into submission. And that is an ideology that is winning when we flatten the dynamic to where we simply say Israel is big and strong and powerful because they've got a big and strong and powerful military that's supported by the United States. And so there's nothing else we need to talk about in this conflict. Like, obviously, they're the bad guys. Okay, let let me ask this question before we wrap up this segment, because I remember places where I was interning. If I'd written a letter like that, my job was over. Oh, yeah. I think most places that would have been the case a decade ago. So how is that possible? What makes that thinkable? Well, I think there's a a culture of a kind of hyper-egalitarianism, and Mm -hmm. I don't mean egalitarianism in a theological sense, but in a sense of every person has the exact same voice and the exact same level of authority which often is an overreaction to authoritarianism of some kind, but ends up in just another authoritarianism. And you can see this happening all over the place. I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago who was, he used to work for Bill Clinton back in the day. And he said, I had somebody come up to me that works for me who said, I just don't feel emotionally flourishing in what we're doing today. So I'm going to go home. And he said, I'm trying to imagine even saying the words to Bill Clinton. I'm just not emotionally flourishing with what is happening today. I'm going to leave. And he said, that doesn't even, that's not even a political issue. It's a culture that is crazy when it comes to this. I really do think you're right. It's like a democratization of all opinion. Everyone at any time on any space is allowed to have a valid opinion about something and it should be heard. And it's a tricky space because I do not want to diminish the power of young people having voice in particular issues that help to change whole situations. But also there has to be some resilience with that says, maybe I should just keep my opinion to myself because we need to press through. And I would just add a caveat. The one time that I think it would have been appropriate for White House interns to issue a denunciatory statement would be in the Bill Clinton administration. In the Bill Clinton White House. <laughs> that, 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 that would be the time. time. My goodness. <laughs> there, the are time yes, oh. there are valid times. Yes, there are valid times. It's Christmas. 
And in the spirit of the holiday season, we all need a little dose of Kevin McAllister when he crawled out from under his mom and dad's bed and ran outside and said, hey, guys, I'm not afraid anymore. (laughs) So we'll be right back. We are back, and joining us for this conversation is Thomas Kidd, who serves as a research professor of church history at Midwestern. He's also the author, most recently, of Thomas Jefferson, A Biography of Spirit and Flesh from Yale University Press. I'm a big Thomas Kidd fan. I'm excited to have you on the show. Thomas, welcome to The Bulletin. Thanks for having me. So we wanted to have you join us because in the last several weeks, there have been a number of iconic American figures who've passed away. Rosalind Carter passed away, Henry Kissinger passed away, and there was certainly a spectrum of thought in remembering them. But one of the things that struck me was how many times I saw the words war criminal in the headline of the, you could almost sort of make a meme out of it. And certainly Kissinger's not someone without controversy. But I think for Christians, it raises this ethical question about how do we remember people both in the immediate aftermath of their death and then in the long-term aftermath of their death. And Thomas, this is what you do all day, every day. So I'd be interested in your thoughts. How do we think about the legacy of people in their death? And how do we think about this tension of honoring the dignity of who they were and being truth-tellers about the things that we might object to. Yeah, I tend to write about people who are, have been dead much longer than these people. <laughs> Their relatives and so forth don't tend to talk back as much. But it, it really is a conundrum. And I think especially when you get people for Christians who are revered in various parts of the Christian tradition, that it gets really sticky about how to talk about people in a respectful way, but not as if they are just unalloyed saints. And so what you tend to get now in American culture, as usual, are the extremes. One extreme is if we can find anything that does not live up to modern moral conventions, that we cancel them and we say they're useless. We can't talk about them anymore. And then you get people, especially a lot of Christian conservatives, who react against that and say, I'm sick of cancel culture and so th- therefore, if we say someone like Jonathan Edwards, we, we say something about slave owning, then we're criticized as being woke and the usual <laughs> routine that we go through on these sorts of issues. And so I think that somehow we've got to find a middle way of talking about people in the past or the recently deceased in, in such that we're honest about who they were and where relevant their failings, but we don't talk about it in an arrogant way such that, for instance, we assume that if we had been in their position that we would have done better than they did. I think we're usually not given to certainty that if we had been in a person in the past in their position that we would have necessarily done better. I'd love to hear your perception of how all of these prominent deaths have unified and divided. You have the picture at First Lady Carter's funeral of all of the First Ladies, and there were some that were saying, wow, what a picture of unity that you have all of these women, and then others saying, and yet one of them made sure that they dressed in a way that stood out to make sure that there was a clear division. How do you perceive this kind of unifying and dividing effect of death? And even more personally, how do we think of that as we live our lives? Is it possible to live a life where there is no one divided over your funeral? Yeah. And I think death and and funerals really do present particular challenges because obviously it's an emotionally sensitive thing. And Russ can probably remind us what country song talks about living so the preacher doesn't have to lie. (laughs) That's a theme that that comes up about there's a, a certain burden to talk as positively as you can about certain figures. But it seems like Kissinger in particular has not been treated that way. And I don't have a dog in the fight about Kissinger, but now it seems like it's easier with someone like Rosalind Carter, who seemed pretty easy to describe as a fundamentally decent person, where people don't have the same assurances about Kissinger. And of course, Sandra Day O'Connor recently died, and she immediately intersects 
controversies about pro-life, pro-choice, she's controversial as as well. I yeah, I'm a fan of the sort of public service model of knowing when to be critical and when it's time to be magnanimous and kind and and be you know as positive as you can be. And so I think that yet yeah, funerals especially civic funerals in the sense of a, a first lady has passed away or something really can have that effect and and I think that maybe at least some Americans look at the Carters and think, even if I disagree with them politically, here's a model of civil service, civic service, that you have people who are just basically fundamentally decent people. And that is still an important value in American civil society. And so whatever we might think about Jimmy Carter's politics or uh, Rosalind Carter's politics, let's try to be as kind and, and unified about this a person's memory as we can. The poet David White says when you go to a funeral and they read the eulogy and they talk about all the things the person achieved and their career and the, the awards they won and all of that kind of thing, the room is cold. It's like you, you remember these things, but there's a coldness. But then when they talk about the things that the person loved – their obsession over the team they loved or the music they loved or the stamp collection and then the friendships they had, the bonds they had, that's where the whole room begins to come alive. And that's where both the joy and the grief of a remembrance really lives. And it was interesting because probably the first three or four things I read about Kissinger were deeply negative on Kissinger. And then I read a remembrance of somebody who knew him personally and whose father was actually a close personal friend of Kissinger's. And the re reflections were basically about the friendship between these two people. And it was so different because in a sense, it doesn't take away anything of what you might make of his career and his decisions about the Vietnam War and his decisions about engagement with communism and Cambodia and all of these things that are very debatable and questionable. And that Kissinger himself was pretty bare about, like pretty open about these were the decisions we made. And I think he had his own reflections and regrets about some of those things. But there's something unavoidable when you get to the personal, when you get to the relationships. When Part of the story that he told was he talked about how when Kissinger and his father had known each other for a long time before he met his mother. And when he met his mother, just the joy he had to meet her and the joy he gave her, the affection he showed her, the way she came alive, it just reminded me that human beings are deeply fascinating and we're made in the image of God in a way where even if you think this man's a complete and total monster, which I don't personally think is a fair characterization, but even if you think he is, there's these complicated things where, you know, even the villains of our history are made in God's image and have these kinds of relationships and have that kind of impact on people. It's remarkable. That's one of the things that I'm most thankful for in terms of just training for ministry was having to do funerals for people I didn't know because there was a funeral home that would just call and say, we've got somebody, they don't have anybody to do the funeral, will you come and do it? And I would find myself at one point standing in the back with the pallbearers who were looking at the casket and the family gathered around it. And one of them said, bless their hearts, they're better off. He was the meanest man I ever knew. And I thought, you know, if you've gotten to the end of your life and your pallbearers are saying that, <laughs> you have really um, gone a bad direction. But I would have to learn how to be honest, not to lie about someone while also recognizing, okay, this isn't the time to confront all the problems that this person had. And instead, like you said, Mike, you've got this very complicated Christian view of every person in the image of God, and therefore common grace is in some way present there and every person a sinner. And that is really complex. And I, I found myself often in funerals where I lose respect for the officiating clergy because I think you're lying. You, you mm -hmm. cannot get up and say that this person was compassionate or whatever it was. But the best times I've seen are when someone says, and I've tried to do this myself, okay, we all know this was a complicated person. But... <laughs> 
here are the things that we can be grateful for from God in terms of this life. And uh, I think often with public figures, it's a little different because you are going to have a rundown of the things that they did. But the sense of just immediately attacking a corpse uh, just doesn't sit well with me. There was a similar issue with the recent passing of Bishop Carlton Pearson, who Mm -hmm. in the early stages of his life was a great legacy, a product of the Azusa Street revivals and really building up this Pentecostal fervor with music and preaching and then pretty much became a universalist and nearly denounced his understanding of scripture, of heaven, of hell, of judgment. And so at his funeral, there were mixed reviews. There were people there who really wanted someone to say he was a heretic. They wanted that to be said. On the flip side, there were those who refused to acknowledge anything about him, which kind of made it awkward because he said that there's no judgment and therefore there's no real heaven and he's dead. It just creates all of these complications. Thomas, I was just going to ask you, flipping it around then, as a historian who's looking at these things later, how much does the humanity of these characters, like the desire to show that that those other dimensions affect the way you do your work? It came out probably most clearly in my biography of George Whitfield, who was the great evangelist of the Great Awakening of the 18th century and was not only a, a slave owner, but really was a pro-slavery activist. And so it's a really grinding tension with someone like that, where you see the Lord is using his ministry in such powerful ways in the 1700s, and yet he's promoting the expansion of slavery in the American South. This just encapsulates the problem. For instance, I discovered in an archival source that he had actually illegally introduced slaves into colonial Georgia, where it was slavery was originally illegal for the first 10 years of colonial Georgia's history. And, mm-hmm. and so I felt the tension in my gut about, I'm, I'm just going to slide that document back in because, because I, I admire this man's ministry, but the, you see this just rot in his personal life, which is, Whitfield's not the only pastor who's ever had that said about him. And again, I, I think you, you try your best to be capable of, of admiring the good where you can be candid about the bad and very bad where we're warranted. But I just find it's very helpful to always engage in that thought about, do I know I would have done better? And maybe you would have in Whitfield's case. Maybe you would have, because he really does stand out as someone who is aggressively pro-slavery in his context. But when you think about Kissinger, I read a quote from Kissinger getting ready for this talk where he said, I think all of you would have made the same decisions about bombing in Vietnam and Cambodia that I did. And I find that sobering. When you think about the weight of responsibility on this man's shoulders, I'm not at all confident that he did what was right, but I'm more sobered by the idea of what would I have done if I'm sitting there in the Nixon administration and all the competing issues about diplomacy and trying to get out of this morass in Vietnam, what would I have done? I can't say for sure that I would have done what, uh, that I would have done something different from Kissinger. I think it's well put. Thomas Kidd, thank you so much for joining us for this segment, and we will be right back. We are back and here to talk with Mike Kelsey, one of the newest lead pastors at McLean Bible Church. I am excited, Mike, to have you on the show with us today. I'm really glad to be on. Thanks so much for having me. So let's talk about this historic appointment for you and what this means to be leading alongside David Platt. How do you feel? I'm pretty blown away, to be honest, on a couple levels. One, I've been at the church now for 16 years, and my wife, Ashley, has been here for 18. And so most of our adult life has been in this church, and this church family has seen us grow up in ministry, and I'm so thankful for that. And then just with everything we've gone through as a church over the last couple of years, to see just how genuinely excited our church family has been and how encouraging they've been to us has just been, it's just been a gift. How do you see your own kind of experience, particularly growing up in a predominantly black church, 
influencing and affecting your leadership in what is today a, a very multicultural church, but still a predominantly white church. How do you mm-hmm. see your past interfacing with what you're doing now? Yeah, I think that's a great question because I think a lot of people of color and, and African Americans in particular, I think wrestle with that. If you come into a predominantly white church from a, a different ethnic background, and I think one of the things that at least some people do is they check that heritage at the door, whether it's that they feel ashamed of it or they feel it's inferior, or maybe they just think they have to in order to fit in. And I'm really thankful that by God's grace, I haven't done that. Our church hasn't required me to do that. And so I really see, and I got a chance to tell our my home church family, New Samaritan Baptist Church, this at the installation, a lot of the fruit that our church family gets to enjoy now grew from the roots and, and the seeds and the soil of not only my particular local church and my wife's local church that she grew up in, but just the black church tradition. It's been a joy and a struggle at times to figure out how do I bring my full self? How do I get used to being in a different environment while being myself? How do I raise kids in an environment that's different than what I grew up in, but also have them connected to and rooted in their heritage? And yeah, I think over the years, the way I describe it is when I first came to McLean Bible Church, I was trying to find my place. And I think this is a journey that a lot of people of color have to walk. I was trying to find my place, whether that's people's Seinfeld jokes. And I'm like, I don't know that. Now, if you make a Martin joke, I'll get that. So trying to find my place. But then for me in particular, I think a lot of people would say this, once Trayvon Martin was murdered, something shifted for me. It went from trying to find my place to trying to find my voice. And that's when I think God began to put on my heart a, a sense of stewardship, that you're there for a reason and you need to steward the voice that I've given you. And so I've tried to do that, obviously, when it comes to issues like race and justice, but also just the beauty of being in a multi-ethnic church and contributing from the heritage that God has, has blessed me with. So that's been a huge joy. Do you have a way of doing that when you say trying to think through how to bring my whole self, but also contextualizing? What's the thought process that you go through to try to figure out how to do that? Yeah, I'll say this. I think one of the things is you want to be fully committed to, fully immersed in your local church community. And so if you're in a multi-ethnic church, you're in a predominantly white church, if these are the members that you're in this covenant relationship with, you want to be fully invested there. But I think you also have to work hard to stay connected to the soil that you grew out of. And so I can speak from my vantage point, but also because we're a multi-ethnic church, we just have people from every different kind of ethnicity, nationality, racial group. And I try to encourage them to do the same thing as well. We got a lot of Korean and Chinese brothers and sisters in our church and our emerging generations trying to encourage them, hey, you stay connected. You, you need to learn, study, be familiar with the stories of those who have come before you One, because it keeps you grounded in who God and his providence has made you to be, but also it it better equips you to contribute that. So I think staying connected to those roots of heritage is one. And obviously that was a little bit easier for me. My dad's a pastor. My mom is a leader in the church and just an an incredible woman of God and my mother-in-law. And so we, we have those natural connections to the churches that we grew up in. So that's one thing. I think the other is staying in honest dialogue with the members of your local church, especially in really hot, hostile times. I think having spaces where you're able to have that type of honest dialogue. And then another thing I'd say is, I think it is very important in a multi-ethnic church, and I'll just, again, speak as a black Christian. It has been so important for my wife and I, although we've been fully invested and committed in our church, to have people within our church who understand intuitively what it feels like to try to navigate what we're trying to navigate. And so having community within our community where there's just times where we can just be honest and we don't have to translate, but we're all committed together to now re-emerging back into the broader life of the church in a way that hopefully is unifying and encouraging and truthful and in a way that really helps the, the church grow. You had a real experience with that 
congregants saying that people like you and David were pushing on them a wokeism, a political angle, a racial angle that they didn't feel was true to who they were. How did you navigate that intensity? Yeah, I'll give just a little bit of context for listeners. I think there were different groups of people that were a part of some of the conflict that we walked through. And I think it's important to mention that. There were people, quite frankly, who were just, man, they just wanted to attack the church. They were just upset. And I think it parallels what has been happening in the United States. We had, at one point, a leader in our church, a white leader who, in 2020, with the election, said, in one year, I lost my country and I lost my church. As we were talking about race and politics. I think we had that crowd that was just like, hey, I'm gonna make it a point to try to pull McLean Bible Church back to whatever they perceived it used to be. I think there was another group though that was just genuinely hurt, confused, didn't understand, I think perceived us to be a certain kind of way. And, and I'll speak for myself, I think there were some ways that I, you know, mistakenly contributed to some of that misperception. And so there, there are people across the spectrum. I, I think some bad actors in a sense, and then some people that was just genuinely like, what is going on? I think navigating that was difficult. What made it just God was so kind and so gracious and sustained us through it. I would attribute though, a lot of the way we were able to navigate through that, I would attribute on a human level to the leadership of our church. David took a lot of hits and still continues to do so. And if it wasn't for his courage to not only speak up and speak out, but to do it in a way, again, speaking as a black leader in a church like ours, to do it in a way that essentially said, oh, we're, me and Mike are in this together. Oh, we believe the same things. We have the same convictions. We wanna go in the same direction. And so I don't know that we could have gotten through it, to be honest, without his courage and faithfulness in that and the courage of our elder board to help shepherd our congregation through that and have hard conversations. So I, I think our, having leaders that were unified and committed to saying, we're gonna live out our biblical convictions no matter what it costs, but we, we wanna do that wisely, but we're gonna do it boldly and courageously. I think that was huge. And I think another, a huge part of it too was just enduring, <laughs> staying long enough, and this is not for everybody, but staying long enough to see God's faithfulness come to full fruition and now emerging out of that to look back and have a more unified church now than we did when we went into all that conflict is just a beautiful thing. So there were a lot of things in between. There were a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations, a lot of sermons, and a lot of decisions that we had to make. But trying to stay unified in the midst of that as a leadership team. And it doesn't mean we always agreed. There were definitely times where we had some pretty intense disagreements as senior leaders and, and elders. There were times where elders pulled me to the side and said, all right, young man, <laughs> I need you to, and I just kept, I, I, Lord will bring me back to First Peter 5, clothe, young men, clothe yourselves with humility. And in particular, in that context, it's talking about how you relate to the elders of the church. And yeah, we tried to just hang in there together and be honest together, but it was the leaders of our church stepping in and stepping up. And I think God used that. Michael, you said not for everybody, and I agree with that. But a lot of black Christians who have been really hurt in majority white or multi-ethnic spaces, and a lot of it having to do with anytime there's a moving from just broad generalities when it comes to race to actual specifics of what it means to bear one another's burdens. How does a person know whether what he or she needs to do is to keep enduring and press forward, or when that becomes, you're actually hurting yourself and not accomplishing change. That's a hard thing, I think, for a lot of people in almost any context to figure out. What advice would you give to somebody? Two, two things immediately come to mind. People of color have community outside of their predominantly white local church, which is great. I don't think that's sustainable though, especially in times where there's so much cultural heat and, and pressure. And so I think you have to have community within your local body. And some people are gonna live in a context where they're not able to have that. But ideally within your local body, 
because you need that space to let your hair down, kick your shoes off and say, I'm mad and have people understand it. And to be able to say I'm mad without having to immediately in that moment, it's like a person who's grieving after they lost somebody they love. In that moment, it's an additional grief. It's an additional hardship in that moment to have to articulate a theology and a theodicy and a, all that. And so I think the same thing when it comes to these racial issues. So I think you need some community within your church. But I would say number one, so if you don't have, that to me is a red flag because I'm gonna say, I don't know how long you're gonna be able to sustain that. But the first thing I would say is your leadership. If, you, if the leadership of your local church or the leadership of the organization you're a part of, if they do not share your convictions, then there needs to be some conversations. And if you don't see, and I don't wanna put a timeline on this because I've been here 16 years, but if you don't see concrete, observable signs that people there are committed to you in the fullness of who God has made you to be and are committed to the body growing together in an Ephesians 4 kind of way, right? That when each part is doing its work, the whole body grows into the head who is Christ. If they're not committed to saying, listen, we need to learn more about justice from your perspective and your tradition. We need to know, learn more about the immigrant experience from your heritage and your experience. If they're not committed to that, I think the clock has started on your time there if you want, because I think a lot of people feel like God is requiring them as a matter of faithfulness to just stay and endure. And he might be, and I wanna leave room for that, but I don't see anything in scripture that requires you to just stay. I, we live in the United States of America. We're not in some country where there's two churches. And mm -hmm. so I think you can flourish in a local church that shares your convictions and where you can be, and this is the big thing for me, where you can actually be discipled in the fullness of who you are, because I think we need to bring all of who we are under the Lordship of Christ. So if you're in a church that is either unwilling or ill-equipped to help you do that, I don't think you're required. And, and in a lot of cases, I would say, I think you should leave if you're not able to be at peace with all people, if you're not able to really grow and bring all of who you are under the Lordship of Jesus. If your church, and this is, my wife and I got to the point, this point in our church, and I expressed this to our leaders. For a while, it felt like our church was a hindrance to our ministry. So if I'm sharing the gospel here in the DC area with friends or neighbors, I, I don't want to have to worry that when I bring them to my church or they follow me on social media and see my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in my church, that those people are gonna say things that are out of the character of Christ or just unbiblical in ways that will create an additional stumbling block for them to be able to see Jesus. And so I think there's a missional consideration in that, in that as well. So those are a few things that I try to talk to folks about that Ashley, my wife and I have had to navigate. I appreciate you saying that because it also taps into uh, one of the other challenges with multicultural and multi-ethnic churches, and that is the lack of people of color in leadership positions in those churches. And then uh, along with that, a fear that when you put a Mike Kelsey in as lead pastor, then you're going to, quote, turn the church black. Or there's a fear that the ethnicity of one will become the dominant ethnicity of all. How do you reconcile that? And then my question alongside that, what is your vision for how God might use you in this place of leadership at this time? Yeah, I'll start with that last part. I think for me, and again, this is not me really speaking on behalf of McLean Bible Church right now. This is just me personally stepping into this role, what I'm praying and dreaming about. There's kind of three questions that have been kicking around my mind and heart that I hope God I hope God will maybe answer these questions through our church. And one of them is, can a mega church be a biblically healthy church? And I think the answer is yes, and there are great examples, but I think a lot of people still have that question. And I think a lot of unbelievers, they might not say biblically healthy church, but when they see so many headlines that are not very flattering of the church, I think there's a, an increasing skepticism in our culture broadly about authority and institutions, 
I think that gets directed at the mega church in a particularly intense way. And so can a mega church be a, a biblically healthy church, really living out what we see when we look at scripture, that, that where there's healthy, robust membership and pastoral leadership and biblical teaching and real fellowship. And we don't want to stand before God one day to give an account for the souls that he's entrusted to us and say, but God, we were a mega church. God, how, how can we possibly live out the biblical vision of the church with several thousand people? We're not willing to stand before God and do that. So that's one question. I think uh, another question is, can a multiracial church be a church that effectively reaches disciples and empowers people of color as people of color? I think a lot of us have seen Dr. Corey Little Edwards' work and her conclusion was multi-ethnic churches generally only work to the extent that white Christians are comfortable. And I think we've seen that play out in the statistics, but also anecdotally. And I just don't want to give my life to that version of the multi-ethnic church. I really want to see, I believe in the multi-ethnic church, not exclusively because I praise God for ethnic specific churches for all kinds of reasons, but I do want to see a, a multi-ethnic church that genuinely invites and empowers people of color as people of color and contribute the fullness of who God has made them to be. And then can the church effectively reach an, an emerging, increasingly secular generation? I know a lot of us are thinking about that. So those are three questions in my mind that really just, they keep me up at night and they get me excited about in an Ephesians 3.20 kind of way that God is able to do exceedingly more above all we could ask for or imagine according to the power that works in us. And so I, I know that's not like a, a vision statement. Those are questions and the verdict is still out, I think for us, but I'm hopeful and I'm excited. I do think there are some very real dynamics. And I shared with our elders as we were praying through this and considering this, I shared with them that white flight is a real thing, not just for cities, but in churches. And we know that statistically, but we know that anecdotally with many of the churches that we could name that have been led by a person of color or in particularly African-American that have been historically predominantly white. I'm praying that we'll defy the statistics. I see encouraging signs of that in our church. And I think the, the installation was a picture of that in our church family, having these older ladies in our church, one older Indian woman, this one white woman who's like 86 years old, been in our church for over 30 years. It's just a beautiful picture. So I think those dynamics are very real, but we've had very honest, raw conversations about that to say, this is not a fairy tale. This is real life. And real life has a lot of complexity in it. And we're trying to navigate that faithfully and truthfully, but also with gentleness and, and with grace. So I'm excited. We're excited for this new role for you, for David, for your congregation, and for Ashley. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you to our listeners for joining us this week. We'll see you back next week. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. It's produced by Clarissa Mall and Matt Stevens. Post-production by TJ Hester. Our art for this episode is by Rick Shooks. Music by Dan Phelps. And social media by Kate Lucky. Thanks for listening.